Quickly, if you have a Bible this morning. Wow. Powerful, powerful, powerful time of worship. Powerful time of worship. Whew. It's kind of hard to come behind that to try to preach or teach. Still continuing this morning in a series of teachings we started uh, a few weeks back now on the Tabernacle of Witness. Uh, and for this portion, this segment, we're going to title the message, The Horns of the Altar. The Horns of the Altar. And hopefully in February, I should pick back up again the teachings on the family. But for right now, we're on the Tabernacle of Witness. Becoming God's dwelling place so that we can be the instrument of God to spread forth the fragrance of God over the earth. And so in particular this morning, the horns of the altar, Exodus chapter 27. Exodus 27, verses 1 and 2. You shall make an altar of acacia wood, five cubits long and five cubits wide. The altar shall be square and its height shall be three cubits. You shall make its hands on the eight four corners. Its hands shall be of one piece with it. And you shall overlay it with bronze. Now just flip over to Exodus 29. One verse there in verse 12. Exodus 29 verse 12. You shall take some of the blood of the bull and put it on the hands of the altar with your finger. And pour all the blood beside the base of the altar. Now, during the last couple of weeks, I told you, I mentioned to you that whenever you come across a new word or a word for which you had no real clear understanding prior to the time you are reading it, it's always important to go back to the first mention so you can begin to see the meaning of that word unfold. Here in this passage in Exodus 27, we are introduced to the horns of the altar. And as the subject of our talk this morning, I want to give us quickly the usage of this word horns in the scripture from which we're going to derive the message that we are bringing today. The very first time that word was mentioned in the scripture was in Genesis chapter 22, in verse 13. And it is very interesting to see the language that was used to describe it. Many of you may recall, God had told Isaac to go to Mount Moriah to offer his son unto him as a burnt offering. And after Abraham had taken three days' journey, he got to the spot where God had spoken to him about. And as he was about to offer his son, to kill his son as a sacrifice. We are told that God told him to stop and that he looked behind him and that there was a ram that was caught in a thicket through the ram's horns. Are you hearing me this morning? Notice there, that's the first time that word horns is used, but notice in particular, this ram that was to be a substitute for Isaac, was not just standing there willingly. The Bible said it was what? Caught, apprehended, seized, held. But this holding was not just by the tail, nor by the torso, but we are told it was caught by the horns. Thereby, Inferring to us that horns on an animal is a place of its strength. God seized its strength so that Abraham can take it. Now, what is so interesting about this whole discussion is this. Every animal sacrifice that will be offered on that brazen altar, Exodus 27, 
the animals never went to the altar willingly. Those of you who have ever raised domestic animals, you understand what I'm talking about. Try to lead a goat to the slaughter. Or a cow, or a ram, or a bullock. They, you have to drag them. You have to drag them because they understand the nature of the beast. They understand the business. They know you're about to put a knife to their throat. Never will it. Are you hearing me? So, these horns, of which we are talking about this morning, Exodus 27, was a means under God's dispensation in Israel to have the animal that was, un that was unwilling to be bound to the altar. If you don't bind them to the altar, what do you think is going to happen? They're going to leave the altar. Many of us have been leaving the altars. When God brings us in, deals with us, with us tries to correct us, give us instruction, because God has not bound us to the horns, because today he does not bind us as he did back then. Today he uses the courts of his love. Hosea chapter 11 verse 4. That's what he's using now to bind us. The love of God, Paul says, constrains him. I want you to appreciate what God is saying to us here. Isaac, the son of God of promise in the Old Testament, went to that altar willingly. The animal that was substituted for him had to be caught, to be caught. But he went willingly. Thereby pointing in advance to the king that we just sang about. To the master, the supreme one, the holy one, that great one, the awesome one, the almighty one, that great God of the universe, the Lord Jesus Christ himself, who said to us in John chapter 10, verses 17 and 18, he said, no one takes my life. He said, but I will what? Lay it down. In other words, you don't have to bind me like you do the sacrifices. I am a willing and able sacrifice. Now, the good news for you and I is this. For Isaac, who was willing, what happened? He got his life back. For Jesus, who was willing, what happened? He got his life back. For those animals that were dragged and had to be bound, what happened? They died and stayed dead. So the point to us this morning as we launch into this subject, the way to live in the life of God is by losing your life. By laying it down. Amen? First mention of the word hands. Second mention, well not second mention, second use rather of hands in scripture. So the first use is the fact that it's used to bind the unwilling animals. The second use we see at the battle of Jericho in Joshua chapter 6 verses 1 and verses 4 through 5. I'm not going to read it. We have God told, Jericho, uh, told Joshua that he should blow the horns from Rams on, blow it seven times when he marches around Jericho. And what happened? The walls came down. There's a blowing of God that's taking place right now. And every wall of Jericho that has contained you, if you hook into that blowing, and if you align yourself to what God is saying and doing, I am telling you, every wall of Jericho that has sought to keep you bound, that has sought to limit you, the horns of God, tropetic, tropetic utterances, the horns of God is about to blow the lids off. So that the people of God can be free to serve God and be a blessing to God. In Jesus' name. Amen. And then the third use of horns in the scripture, we see this very clearly in 1 Samuel chapter 16, in verse 1 and verse 13, when God spoke to Samuel to go anoint him a king in the house of Jesse. The Bible says Samuel took what? He took his oil in a horn. Huge. The horns were used in Israel to keep oil. Oil is the symbol of the anointing. So when someone was going to go anoint David, he carries on, which had the oil in it. Contrast that with King Saul, who at his anointing, the prophet did not use the horn. Rather, he used what? A flask. He said, Pastor, what's the big deal difference? Huge. A flask is man-made. Man manufactures flask. Horn 
is a testimony that an innocent life has been poured out. Are you hearing me? So, when you look at the life of David and the life of Saul, you can almost tell, you can almost see clearly that Saul was an accident waiting to happen. Even though God worked with him and God used him some, but you can almost see. Amen? So, those are the uses of this word horns from the scriptures. Now, what does, what does it represent? Remember this morning we are focusing on the horns of the altar? What does it represent? And I have to move very quickly here. Number one, it represents for us the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Let's go to the scripture in the New Testament. First, no, Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1, verses 68 and 69. Blessed is the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people. What did he do? He has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. Who is the horn of salvation? Jesus Christ. Amen? So number one, it represents the Lord Jesus Christ. Number two, it represents kings and rulers. I will not read the scripture, but I'll give you the reference in Daniel chapter 8, verses 20 21. Thirdly, it represents strength. We can see that in 1 Samuel chapter 2, in verse 1, and 2 Chronicles 18, verse 10, it represents strength. Oh, wow, we need to read this one. Number four, it represents a place of refuge and protection. A place of refuge and protection. We can read this in Psalms 18, in verse 2. It says, the Lord is my rock. And my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my strength, in whom I will trust, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. Amen. And as we move forward in the message later on, you will see clearly how that the horns is a place of refuge and protection. Next, it represents honor. You can see this in Job chapter 16, verse 4. 15, Job 16, verse 15, or Lamentations chapter 2, in verse 3. Also, it represents dominion. 1 Kings 1, verse 39. Next, it represents glory. 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 13. Then again, we see it represents fierceness. Fierceness. Daniel chapter 8, verses 5 and 9. Fierceness. And then, of course, it represents also defense. 1 Kings 22, verse 11. And lastly, it also represents exaltation. Psalms 89, verse 17, and verse 24. And exaltation there means prosperity and triumph. Amen? Because of time, I could not go through every one of those scriptures to show them to you, but please read them. It's very powerful. It represents all of those things. Now, back to Exodus 27 now. Back to Exodus 27. We know how horns are used in scriptures. We now know what they represent or symbolize. Now, let's begin to unpack this scripture in the time that we have left. 